Happy solstice, you filthy pagans! So, I'm gonna be doing something a little different for the holidays this year. Wait a minute, isn't it March? I'm doing a review. You know, that thing I said I wouldn't do, but you know what? I'm finally feeling up to it. What do we got today? Oh. The Batman! Arcs of Ham! The Arkham franchise is a series of all-around decent cape shit games. Revolutionary when they first came out, but when you look at the series nowadays, some of it is aged like milk. Arkham Asylum is a good example. When the 2009 title first came out, yeah, I bet you we did consider it groundbreaking. For the time. But let's revisit this for a bit. If you played Asylum now, especially after having played later entries in the series, you might notice some paint has peeled off and some splotches of mold are growing on the wall. Nothing too serious yet, but you should probably call somebody anyway. After going through the game for more than maybe three or four hours at a time, things will start to drag. One of the first things you'll spot is, ugh, ugh, oh god, what's wrong with your face? Some of the character models will have sunken in bug eyes or other exaggerated uncanny facial features. This may have been a stylistic choice, but I'm kind of glad they phased it out in later entries. But I'm not here to bitch about the looks. How does everything else hold up? Hand-to-hand -hand combat, while enjoyable at first, doesn't have a lot of variety and kind of solidifies the press two buttons to win meme that the franchise is known for. Sure, you can use a couple different tactics like tossing batarangs and doing a couple special moves while you're racking up combos, but why should you bother doing that when you can just deck a bitch or break one of his legs? You could say that the incentive is the Xbox Gold you get from achievements, but that's not nearly enough to give me a sense of accomplishment for doing them. Then there's Predator Encounters, which inspire just about as much imagination. String up some goons from Gargoyles, wait for the choking animation to finish before you get shot, drop on this dude from a skylight, kick him, punch him on the ground... There isn't a lot here. Although you get this really stupid upgrade to your Bat Claw called the Ultra Bat Claw, you can pull down weak walls with it and also do this. Wait, I think I just killed those guys. Maybe this isn't so boring after all. Yeah, for a game that goes off about Batman's no-kill rule, you can do a lot of just straight-up cold-blooded murder. Regardless of what your blue vision tells you, yeah, these dudes are dead. I just threw this guy off a ledge in an abandoned catacomb. He's not getting back up from that. Oftentimes, you'll hear loud cracks and snaps when you smack goons upside the head, but nah, they're, 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 they're just sleeping. Man, these shurikens look pretty sharp. Here's a section of the game called Extreme Incarceration. It has an electrified floor- Oh, why is this here? All these people are dead! If I took this game seriously, I would be upset. Too bad I think it's really funny. Speaking of things that don't feel right, the writing in this game is a bit... rough, to say the least. For example, there's a part of the game where you have to track down a bioweapon formula and destroy it so Joker can't replicate it. So we follow this trail of fingerprints a doctor so kindly left behind for us. Damn, bitch, you really gotta touch everything? Anyways, we end up at the library where we see that you... you left it out in the open. You left a dangerous blueprint out as a bookmark for anyone to find. You know what? Give me back your goddamn doctorate. You're clearly too stupid to have it. <laughs> well, at least you can't practice medicine anymore. Going back to the lack of variety in this game and as a general overview before we move on, let's talk about the boss fights in Asylum. Or rather, as I call them, villain events. Because I can't really call a lot of these moments in the game boss fights. First, you get introduced to stealth mechanics through a hostage situation with Victor Zaz. You swing behind him to the other end of the room, drop kick him, done. We get a call from the Riddler, the less we talk about the annoying Riddler content, the better off we'll be for it. He's not nearly as annoying in this game as he is further down the line, but let's not dwell on it for now. We'll, we'll get there when we get there. Then you tussle with a giant Coomer in a fight that honestly takes a lot longer than I remember. Jeez, come on, just fucking die already! There we go! We soon have our first encounter with Scarecrow. Sneak around, avoid his line of sight, and shine a bat signal on to make him go away. Repeat two more times. I really like the build-up and atmosphere with these segments. It's one of the best highlights of the game for me. But mechanic-wise, this kinda sucks. It feels way too simplified to really put me on the edge of my seat. We have another stealth encounter where you clear the room, then jump Harley to save Commissioner Gordon. 
Then we get to Bane, and this is where a pattern starts to emerge. This is pretty much every legitimate boss fight in the game. Coomer Bane, Normal Bane, Minion Bane, Two Banes, Skeleton Bane! Too many Banes! After a third and final encounter with Scarecrow, we chase him into the sewers where he then proceeds to get nabbed by Croc, presumably never to be seen or heard from again. Speaking of which, Killer Croc! All we do here is crawl around his lair collecting magic shrooms. Oh, there he is! Let's just, uh... uh yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, we encountered Zaz again a while ago. Went about as well as you might expect. However, if you somehow fail, Joker roasts your ass, so that's a fun touch. Ah, boss fight that's actually different. And it's over! Cool. And finally, after nine hours of gameplay, undercooked textures, and some dumbass PC bugs, we made it. The cream of the crop. The final battle. Here we go! What could it be? Joker Bane. Y you made you made Joker Bane with a mohawk. <sighs> he swipes at you a couple times, jumps up to the ledge, we fight his goons, he turns his back, we pull on his wiener and sock him in the jaw. Do that two more times and roll credits. Well, that was kind of lame. I'd honestly give this game a 7. It's alright, but nothing that's really, Wow, this game's so good, make my pee-pee hard! Enter Arkham City. Surpassing its predecessor in every way, shape, and form, Arkham City is a sequel that blows my nuts off every time I play it, even a decade after its initial release. Sure, the PC version will have a couple bugs here and there, but that doesn't change the fact that this game is a goddamn masterwork. Melee and stealth have a lot more variety and everything just feels more fluid. You have to use strategies for different enemy and weapon types, you can quick draw gadgets mid-combo and it doesn't feel intrusive, there are jammers that disrupt your detective mode and cryptographic sequencer, Exploration is HIGHLY encouraged this go-around, as City has switched its campaign up to be much more centric on its open map. While Asylum had some neat side content here and there in the forms of inmate tapes and the Arkham slabs that you can scan for side narratives, that was pretty much it. Not much else to do except cope with Nigma's bullshit. I mean, you still have to deal with him here, but at least you get to knock him on his ass at the end. Now there's full-on side quests you can play along with the main storyline, which also gives you some stuff to do post-game as you glide around the map to trigger certain events. Hey, Jackass, pick up the phone! Pick up the phone, dumbass! You smell of poo poo pee pee! And thank God, the simple act of just moving around is exhilarating. Especially once you get the prototype grapnel boost upgrade. It's godly! Enemy AI is a bit smarter now, which allows for more challenge. Convicts can scan for your presence on vantage points or wear armor and brandish weapons or shields. But you can combat their tomfoolery by doing cool shit like this. And this. And this, and this. God, love that move. If you're really bad at the game, your shit can definitely get fucked. You are, for once, asked to try this time around. You get some really fun new gadgets as well. Freeze enemies in place, disable guns, use smoke bombs, set off landmines. Ooh, ooh, that guy's toast. But my favorite gadget in the whole game is this REC pulse rifle. Why? Because I get to do stuff like, and, and, and I can also do this. The boss fights are also just mwah. You got Grundy, Ra's al Ghul, Joker, Clayface. Oh, and don't get me started on the freeze fight. You can finish it rather quickly if you know what you're doing on your vanilla playthrough. You use a takedown method on him once and you can't use it again. During this encounter, you are asked to mix things up and maneuver around him constantly. And when you fight him in New Game Plus, you'll need to use just about every technique you have at your disposal or you ain't going nowhere. The bosses are all different. They're all fun in their own ways. I love them. Except for this fight. Fuck this fight in particular. And did I mention this amazing soundtrack? Because it slaps. There's a reason why I didn't talk about the music in Arkham Asylum. It is incredibly forgettable. Right from the start menu to the end credits of City, the game whisks you away on a musical journey. Even if you don't remember a couple of the tracks years later like I have, it's still worth noting. But as a side note, Water Tower can suck a chode. Only 19 tracks are available for consumer purchase on the officially released album. Some of the best tracks in the game are just straight up missing to the point where you'd have to get YouTube riffs of them if you want to listen to them on your own time. If you're going to sell a soundtrack, give us the whole thing, damn it! The story and writing is much more fleshed out. Dialogue feels more natural and engaging, even if it's a bit cliched at times. Sure, it reminds you of the embarrassment that was Buff Joker, but his part in this narrative creates something absolutely beautiful. A nice final send-off for Mark Hamill's portrayal of the character. 
To close off, if you're gonna play an Arkham game all the way through, City is your best bet. Easy 9 out of 10 for me. If I could talk more at length about this title, I would, but that's not what I have brought you here for. You're not here to watch me enjoy myself. I'm here to suffer, and you are here to laugh at my pain. Madman Fartham Borigens. It's a prequel this time, because after killing off our big baddie, where else are we gonna go? I mean, we have an idea for a sequel, we kinda need to plan it out a bit more. Hmm... Nah, fuck that, we need something about Holiday 2013. But we're still in pre-production. Will it have Joker in it? Uh... No, we kind of killed him off since Hamill retired the role. Yeah, we can't sell a Batman game without Joker in it. I'm sure we can think of something. Yeah, no, we'll just do this one without you guys. Make it a prequel and outsource everything to our new Montreal office. What? Your development team is suspended until you learn your lesson. Go sit in the corner. Yep, we now have an Arkham game without Rocksteady. Oh boy. First thing you'll notice before we even started the game is an incredibly bland font choice. I mean, wow. Second is Warner Brothers trying to push you to sign into a WBID account, because I'm just dying to play a multiplayer mode you shut down a mere three years after release. Made by the same team that brought me such hits as Brink. Oh, I sure am missing out there. So why am I reviewing this as a holiday special, you might be asking. It's a Krimbus game. What a joyous holiday it is for me. A Jewish cat. <coughs> the game starts by showing us some of the most abysmal cinematography I've witnessed in a cutscene for a AAA game. Are we sure this is the same series? Batman is the island, Bruce. You've been back for almost two years now. You can't expect me to believe that Gotham's most eligible bachelor is spending another Christmas alone. You just ran out of time. Wait, that's not Kevin Conroy. Who's voicing Batman here? Oh, God, no, why? You picked literally the worst Sonic VA trying to do his best edgy shadow impression. Marvelous. I will be playing this on PC because if you were to buy it now, chances are it would be on Steam. Also, teehee, funny bugs. But let me talk about the PS3 version since that was what I played back when I first bought this game. For those who require a refresher on the DualShock 3, PS3 ports of first and third person shooters needed to have slightly different controls than the 360 version. Xbox controllers are rather convenient when it comes to shooters since the backmost buttons are proper triggers. They feel nice when you press them and squeeze them. If you try to use L2 and R2 for aiming and gunning on the DualShock, your greasy Cheeto fingers will slide off easily. So the solution for PS3 games is to instead configure these inputs to L1, R1 respectively. What's the point of this whole tangent? When you start the game up on PS3, the battering and aiming controls are mapped as if the game were being played on 360 instead. This cannot be changed on console. You have to live with it. This is our first sign the game is going to be a significant step down from previous outings. Enter Blackgate Prison and we open with an obnoxious QTE. The quick time events didn't feel nearly as intrusive in Asylum and City. When you're removing grates or pulling down walls, you feel kind of numb to it. But here, have fun getting the press Y button flash to you while you're in the middle of a cutscene, or you're trying to enjoy a cool fight. More on that later. The combat animations look absolutely ridiculous in this game. You got this wimpy ass punch, this silly cartwheel attack. On ground takedowns, you'll sometimes do the limp dick punch again. And don't get me started with dialogue. In addition to the writing just being generally underwhelming, occasionally when a model needs to say a line, it will unnaturally jerk its head as it restarts the idle animation even during some in-engine cutscenes. Really takes you out of the experience. <laughs> this guy thinks he's safe behind those bars. I'm gonna let him keep his false sense of security. To me too. Shut up. <laughs> Origins massacred my boy. <laughs> I think I'm gonna like this busted ass piece of crap. And now we've arrived at the first boss, Killer Croc. Good God, where have they done with this design? How did you make this worse than Arkham Asylum? These two games are supposed to be in the same canon, right? Anyways, he charges at us and all we gotta do is dodge out of the way. Cape stun him, beat his ass, and threw a battering at the gas tank he's holding over his head and refusing to toss our way for some reason. And then on my end, issues started cropping up. 
Dead. But first, the audio oh, yeah. briefly cut out, so I had to pause to make sure that something wasn't wrong. Yeah, audio just cut out. Then, for the rest of the fight, Croc is now fading in and out of existence because he is not real and has never been real. Wake up! Oh, Jesus! Oh, apparently that was the first time in canon Batman's ever faced Croc, and yet he knew how to deal with him immediately. Cool! The game is prompting us to invest our skill points, so we might as well get something neat. Ignoring the bland slapship menu UI, let's see what we got. Oh, so I have to get these armor upgrades in order to get all the interesting combat abilities. Asylum and City gave us some freedom in that regard. I could choose to play the game with no armor upgrades or keep a couple gadget upgrades out of the equation. You know, let me take a handicap challenge. You want to make Origins fun without upgrading your armor? Why would you want to do such a thing? So we get a briefing on the game. There are eight assassins. <laughs> Seven. Seven assassins after us. That means we get to fight quite a few bosses. Oh, this is looking to be all right. We're introduced to a new fast travel system, which I guess makes sense since now we have in-game access to the Wayne Manor Batcave, so whatever. But uh-oh, turns out the nav points aren't working so good as we have a little stinker jamming the signals. We go down to investigate and oh, it's you. Big Eddie Enigma's back, but now he's a lot more of a nuisance to the game, as he makes us solve puzzles to unlock fast travel points around the map. Let me explain why that's an issue. See, now that the new devs have given us a map that's twice as big as the previous games, things feel a lot more hollow. Don't get me wrong, there's still plenty of mobs to beat on and side quests scattered around the city. We just have to move twice as much to get to mission objectives. Now, at first, you might think this isn't a problem. Exploring the nooks and crannies of Arkham City was part of the fun. Here's the thing about good old Batman AC. The map was as big as it needed to be. If I chose to do so, I have the option to clear Arkham City's world from one end to the other in less than five minutes and have fun launching myself over every rooftop while doing it. In Origins, everything feels a lot slower, even with the grapnel boost, which we should not kinetically have in our possession! I think I need the grapnel boost. But Mr. Fox told you it's not yet ready for field deployment. It's still in the prototype stage. Prototype my ass, Alfred! Oh, sorry, we're calling it the Grapnel Accelerator, so it's fine. It's fine! Everything's fine! In Arkham City, we could tower over pretty much every building rendered in the overworld, with the exception of the obvious walls sectioning the prison off from the civilian population. Origins has structures you simply aren't allowed to vault over because... Well, because fuck you. The game has somehow managed to make one of the simplest, magnificent parts of City as dull as dishwater. In order to get over this tedium, we'll need to activate fast travel routes, the first of which needs to be activated before you can progress through the campaign. Fuck you, Edward, die in a fire. Oh yeah, let's stay on this part for a little bit longer, because here is where more blemishes become noticeable. This is our first predator section. We drop a smoke bomb, zip up to the vantage point, swing over to the back of the room. Well, why can't I swing to the other vantage points? I don't need to turn on detective mode, I can clearly see them. Their presence is jabbing my goddamn pupils. Let me swing over there! Oh, you, you've gotta be kidding me. I have to turn on detective vision to will the vantage points into existence, otherwise the game considers these as non-interactable objects. Phenomenal game design, guys! Now, when Arkham Asylum does this, it's a bit more excusable because it is the first game in the series, it is telling you how everything works, but here, we're at the third game. There is no excuse. Oh, what's that? You want me to initiate this takedown animation? Fuck you, I'm not complying. I can find the grapple point on my own, stop treating me like I'm five! The game now gives us an introduction to a new feature in detective mode, holographic reenactments of crime scenes. <laughs> okay, okay. This is all nice and gimmicky, but is there a logical explanation as to why Batman doesn't have this in previous games? No? Uh, that's what I thought. Man, you guys kind of suck at this whole prequel thing, huh? I can see the card that I need to scan right there. Let me kick this fucking grate open! We're now out and about in the world, and we need to find the penguin so he can tell us where Black Mask is. Let's interrogate this friendly little arms dealer. I'm sure he'll be fine. We track the midget to a rundown ship at the docks where we push past more goons. By the way, the smoke bomb is way too overpowered. Because I can just do this. And get off scot-free. 
We trekked through the cabins of the ship until we encountered the second assassin. Electrocutioner. Well, this should be a fun time. Maybe since he has electric gauntlets, we'll have to dodge around his attack pattern, and it's over. Shit. That's kind of a letdown. I mean, the dude had a full health bar and everything. As we continue pummeling lowlifes, we're introduced to a new enemy type. So now I get to talk about all of them. First, you got your big boys, which are a mix between the mini banes from the first and second game and the Kami twins. They can charge at you, grab you in an attempt to disrupt your combo, and hit you with unblockable attacks. All you really gotta do is keep punching them and you're good. These aren't to be confused with Venom Thugs, which use the trademark Bane Juice. These are a bit more lame since you just pull their plug and then treat them like a normal enemy afterwards. You have to use the same takedown method with the big boys if they have armor plating. My favorite new enemy type, however, has to be the ninjas. Uh, no, not the ones from Arkham City. These guys. These charming little fellows mix up the playing field quite a bit by being sneaky little devils. They can use combinations, throw attacks that need to be double countered, and even counter your own strikes. The new enemy types are one of the few things I actually like about this game. I'll give credit where it's due. Anyways, we choke the chicken and he tells us where Black Mask's safe house is. But before we get any other info, we get snagged by a familiar face. It's Deathstroke. Man, I remember this fight being the shit back when I was a kid. Oh, of course. Nostalgia, my sworn enemy, you have struck yet again. Deathstroke's fight would honestly be a lot more fun if the devs let me trust the counter mechanic and didn't hold my hand with their shitty tutorial. Boiling the fight down to a science, it's kind of bland. It's mostly just hitting and countering, but with QTEs. The worst part is it's the most entertaining fight in the game. How could it get worse? I hear you ask. We'll get there. <laughs> Don't you worry. Thankfully, we get a nice souvenir, the remote claw. This is essentially our stand-in for the line launcher, but hear me out. Have you ever played Asylum in City and wondered, I want to string this guy up, but I don't want to wait in one place to do it. No? Well, uh, too bad. I can also do this. What's that? And the game will try to convince me I didn't just kill a man. Time to pay Black Mask a visit. Before we do that, we have to wrangle our local ANCOM ringleader. Okay, so when new side missions pop up during the campaign, I'm gonna divert attention to those just to get them out of the way. Or at least the ones I feel like finishing. We get to disarm three bombs. <laughs> Sorry, that's, uh, that's not the politically correct term. Mostly peaceful explosive devices scattered around the city before we have our meeting with a notorious hacker 4chan himself. After he busts his little manlit ass, he gives us an unwarranted lecture. And like Roman Sionis or Oswald Cobblepot are responsible. They're just a reflection of our apathy. Cool. The message is always the same. Don't think. Don't question. You can stop now. Fidelity. Once upon a time, that's what defines uh, society. Please stop talking. Worship at the altar of competition. We build fortresses around ourselves. We fight. We betray. Good God, it's like what would happen if a lefty meme were a person. Shut up. Shut up! So after... That... We head to the penthouse and do another hologram-assisted investigation that, once again, looks way too elaborate to be plausible. Jesus Christ, it's a tiny-ass phone. Upon further discovery, we find out that it wasn't Black Mask who put the hit out on us after all, and we come across one name. The Joker. If we find Blackface, we find the Jokeman. In order to do that, we need to access the criminal database of the GCPD. Alright, we're at the station. Let's use this new non-lethal option Alfred recommended us. So that was a waste of time. One Antifa wet dream later, we get to the server room before we have an incredibly forced encounter with a young Barbara Gordon. Because it's a prequel written by hacks. We want to cram in as many references into this small Cornish hen as we can since we didn't buy the turkey mom asked me to get, and I really don't feel like going on another 10 minute drive to Kroger! After finding out where Joker is, we start on our merry way, but before we get very far, we encounter a side mission with Mad Hatter. I'm just gonna get this one out of the way real quick. You know how the Scarecrow levels in the first game had a really nice haunted atmosphere? Uh, well, let's take that, remove the immediate looming threat of a pursuer, and presto, you've made another disappointment. Good job. Time to head to the bank. Well, what do you know? We found our guys. It's finally time for the big reveal. <laughs> oh, sweet, Joker. You're looking cool, by the way. It's been you this whole time. You hired the assassins. 
You've been running Sionis's operation. You know, framing this reveal as a shocking plot twist doesn't really work on our narrative standpoint if you've already told us what it was earlier. Anyways, Hot Topic Joker sucks and as hard as Troy Baker tries, God bless his soul, he can't pull off Hamill. Shut up. First off, can't do the laugh to save his life. <laughs> just, just can't. I've heard amateur YouTubers do a much better job. Second, and this isn't really entirely Troy's fault, he barely tells jokes. I mean, come on, it's the Joker. It's literally in his name. And the jokes that rarely surface are just terrible one-liners, which I can sometimes barely hear thanks to the game's awful sound mixing that boosts the music over everything else. If you're concerned with how quickly I'm blowing through these criticisms, <laughs> don't fret, I will probably get worse. We make our escape out of the bank and... You hear that? Is that a baby crying? Nope, it's just one of our assassins, Lady Shiva, giving us a series of tests to complete. Those tests being save this police officer, fight some ninjas, fail to save the other officer, then fight Shiva herself. Enter posse of ninjas. Alright, I think here is a good place to talk about boss design. And how not to make a boss. First, if one of your boss's big strats is to send minions after you during the fight, you failed. The rest of the big man's fight could be absolutely phenomenal, but if you resort to this cheat trick, you've lost. Even City is guilty of this sometimes. While it doesn't happen nearly as often, it's still an issue. 2. Don't let bosses in your game feel the same. The big boss problem in Arkham Origins is that most of the big baddies feel like normal thugs, but with health bars. Yes, even the Copperhead battle where she poisons you and you have to fight through a bad trip in order to get the antidote. Even the Predator fight with Deadshot literally works on the first principle where his mob just acts as obstacles for your main goal. Once you kick his ass, it's over. Go home. Your objective when making bosses is to avoid these two problems. And this has been tips from a cartoon cat who sort of knows what he's talking about. After we get the government lizard to squeal, we locate the remaining bad boys to a luxury hotel. And hey, it's our old boy Electrocutioner. He seems to be doing well. <laughs> You know, what's the point of hyping this guy up as one of our would-be killers if you're just gonna write him off as a joke? Oh, it's for this new ga- I mean, <laughs> totally cool, not at all lame gadget. These are the shot gloves. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna be nice about these things. For navigation and puzzles, they're used to charge up generators. In combat, they're fucking broken. In City and Origins, you can attain what's called Free Flow Focus, which gives you an attack buff, a speed boost, and gadgets with critical hits. Pretty powerful already. Anything additional would feel tacked on. So the gloves not only do double that damage, but also remove the necessity for cape stun and just hit through shields and armor. I'm only using it because I'm really, really tired of this bullshit. We make it through Joker's- <laughs> Nah, this guy is too lame for me to call him that anymore. I'm just gonna call him Timmy or Jonker. Yeah, Jonker's good. We make it through Jonker shenanigans until we arrive at the penthouse elevator. But before we can meet him, we get ambushed by the large man himself. You have one minute. Do they even have manners where he comes from? Whoa! Cool with the racist comments, buddy! This is a family show! After Jonker blows up an abandoned building, Sonic the Bathog starts beating on him in a fit of roid rage before Bane tosses his salad again, and we begin our first, yes, first fight with him. Insert generic Origins boss fight pattern A as well as a pre-rendered QTE animation with now zero player input. After that's over, Bane launches a rocket at Jonker as he makes his escape. Jonker begins to plummet to his death, but Roger dives in to save him just before impact. And so the day is finally saved. Just kidding, I I'm still stuck here unfortunately. We now cut to Jonker going to therapy where we get to play in his shoes for a bit. And in case you're wondering, no. He's not playable in challenge maps. Why would you ask such a silly question? My name's Halleen. Halleen Krenzel. Oh, come on. We're introducing Harley now? Sure, why should I expect anything subtle from the hacks that wrote the Assassin's Creed games? Where else am I gonna put all this stuffing? Oh, and of course, right after that, we get another My Parents Are Dead scene. We got it. You don't need to do this in every goddamn Markham game, you know. We get the idea. In Asylum, it's excusable because it's the first game. In the second game, both references work really well with the story. Hugo Strange uses the notorious scene on Crime Alley to taunt Batman with the knowledge of his real identity. He's using it to gun under his skin. 
In the other big moment where the event is referenced, the Cake Crusader is mere inches away from death as he sees his mother and father welcoming him to the Pearly Gates. These are very beautiful scenes that have thematic purposes to their presence. Arkham Origins just recycles the scene from the first game and somehow makes it even less subtle just because he saw Jonker shoot his goons in cold blood. With a gun, no less! Oh, good heavens! Alfred wants us to call it for the night, but Roger's still got work to do, so we can't stop here. At least we're given another neat gadget for our arsenal. Wait... Oh, you guys aren't even trying anymore! This is just the freeze grenade from the last game! Alright, that tears it! I'm done playing around! This isn't a game! It's a stretched out, overpriced expansion pack! Sure, you might have a couple new toys here and there, but when you really pause to think about everything, it's just a worse version of Arkham City with a cheaper coat of paint. There's nothing really significant here that makes it stand out. It's a DLC map pack slapped onto a $60 disc. After Alfred calls out the furry's self-destructive behavior, we venture off to sneak into the GCPD once again so we can find info we can use to take down Bane. Once that's done and we have a lock on his tracker, we're on our merry way. Oh, we got some time to interrupt the drug war. Might as well. We resolve a few scuffles before we nail the kingpin at a nightclub. His name is... <laughs> Bird! We probably wrecked his shit. Oh! So now I'm allowed to use the Disarm and Destroy ability that I could previously purchase in Arkham City! And at this late in the game! Fan-fucking-tastic! We find Bane's lair, but no Bane. Oh, what's this then? Oh! Well, it looks like we've been found out. Roger's first decision after coming upon this shocking revelation is to tell Alfred to hide in the cave because someone clever enough to solve your secret identity is absolutely, positively, not smart enough to search your house for your secret headquarters. Some real 40 checkers thinking, buddy. Oh yes, what a big, smart, and strong boy you are. Yes, you are. And before we can prevent the butler from getting his teeth kicked in, we have to deal with... Oh, oh no. Well, we had to get here eventually. <sighs> Firefly. We get up on the bridge so we can disable three of the bombs and power stop hordes of enemy- Wait, why can't I use any of my gadgets here? And I just sock lock myself. No one's attacking me and none of my inputs are registering. Awesome. Restarting. And now it works. Nice. After we disable the bombs, we finally fight TF2 Pyro. Throw the glue grenade, toss a bunch of batarangs, and yank on his dick. It's incredibly tedious, and I wish it didn't last as long as it does. At least with Clayface, you got to use the momentum of one of his attacks against him for extra damage. There's at least some strategy behind that fight. Much more fun. Alright, I'm almost done here. Oh, oh god, you're kidding. I got locked again? While there were several bugs, glitches, and lots of jank I've encountered while playing Origins, nothing has really come close to game-breaking. Until now. Guess I'll just die. And start over again. <laughs> Fuck! Okay, so it's only the halfway point, but I'm no less irritated. That should have been one and done. Alright, I did it. It's over. Why is he still doing his thing? His health is zero. Why are we still going? Oh, great! More button props! Joy. After finally punching Garfield's lights out, yes, that really is his name, and delivering a lame one-liner, You need a new hobby. Roger Man hurries over to the cave to check in on his indentured servant. But unfortunately, we are too late. Even though we've heard his voice in the previous game, Alfred is surely, most definitely, dead as disco. I genuinely hate when prequels pull these fake-outs for characters that are fully alive and well later on in the canon. So what kind of ass poles are we going to use to bring Alfred back? No. No, no, you can't be serious. You're- You're not doing this! It's too stupid! This- This is not happening! Oh, oh, oh my god. We're actually going with this. You are this dedicated to making absolute asses of yourselves! So after we've- oh, I, I can't believe I'm saying this. Use the shot gloves as defibrillators to bring Alfred back to life, we overhear that Junker has already caused massive prison riots at Blackgate. We need to head over and stop him and Bane once and for all. We hear Junker profess his gay love for us as we run through the halls killing- uh, Sorry. <laughs> anesthetizing the lower class as we do so. Hey! Hey, buddy! W wake up! Wake up, buddy!
Oh, he's just a heavy sleeper. We finally catch up with Jonker and he gives us a nice little trolley problem to solve. Bane has a heart monitor strapped to him. Each heartbeat charges the electric chair Jonker is strapped to. After enough time passes, Jonker will fry. So either he dies or Bane does. How does Roger Man solve this problem? Well, you know how he does it. He uses the shock gloves to stop Bane's heart. Duh. Oh, and of course he used the best defibrillators again because one time just wasn't enough. Christ. But we're not done yet as Bane turns his juice up to 11 and transforms into Bakriku. <laughs> oh, fuck. Give me, give, give me a moment. <laughs> chases us and tosses us around like a fucking ragdoll. The takedown prompts are just now choosing to show up whenever they feel like it. So after fighting with the UI, we finish off the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man and zoom over to the chapel to face the Jonker one last time. I'm just gonna slow these combat animations to show just how jank they are. These literally look like stills, you don't even care anymore. Coincidentally, neither do I. Thank God after this, the game is finally over and I can at long last Stop. I could talk about the end game content or the rest of the side missions, but I don't feel like doing it. I could talk about the challenge maps or Cold Cold Heart, but I've been doing this long enough. This expansion sucks. 5 out of 10. I'd rather play just about anything else. That's not what I meant!